We've heard about the solution to the harmonic oscillator time independent Schrodinger equation by cleverness with ladder operators. This is a different, the differential equation we have to work with is something that can be solved by other techniques. In particular, it can be solved by power series. Power series is a common solution technique for ordinary differential equations, so it's useful to see how it applies to the time independent Schrodinger equation. The equation we have to solve is this, essentially h operator psi equals e psi, where we're now only talking about psi as a function of x. We have a second partial derivative with respect to x, that comes from the kinetic energy part of the Hamiltonian operator, and we have a potential energy part here, where the potential function we're now working with, v of x, is the potential in a harmonic oscillator, one half m omega squared x squared basically proportional to the square of the displacement of a particle from some equilibrium position. Often the first step in solving an ordinary differential equation like this is to make some change of variables to simplify the structure of the equation. Basically what we're looking to do is get rid of some of these constants. And it turns out the change of variables that we want to use here, and you can determine this with a little bit of trial and error knowing how change of variables works, is we want to, instead of x, we want to use x is the square root of h-bar over m omega times some new coordinate, xi. Now, what happens when we substitute in new coordinates here? Well, we have to worry about psi of x here, and here, and here. Psi is going to have to, in some sense, change a little bit in order to be represented as a function of xi instead of x. We also very clearly have an x here, and we have to worry about the second partial derivative with respect to x. So let's work through this step by step, and you'll see how, uh, how these substitutions can be made. First of all, we can pretty easily handle these psi as a function of x, because we know what x is. x is the square root of h-bar over m omega times c. So we'll have minus h-bar squared over 2m, don't have to worry about the constants, second derivative of psi, now square root of h-bar over, over m omega c is the argument for psi, but we're still second differentiating with respect to x, dx squared, <coughs> pardon me, plus one-half m omega squared, now substituting in for x, this is relatively easy, we're going to get this squared, h-bar over m omega xi squared, times psi and the argument of psi is again going to be this root h-bar over m omega c equals e times psi, where again the argument of psi is this function of c. You can see there's going to be some cancellation here. I can get rid of some m's and some omegas, but I'll leave that until later. The only difficult term to deal with here is the second partial derivative with respect to x of psi, which is now a function of c. Now when you're taking the derivative of something with respect to a function of something else, you have to use the product rule. Sorry, not the product rule, the chain rule. So I'm going to apply the chain rule to this derivative term, and I'm going to split it up into two steps, two first derivatives instead of one second derivative, just to see how each of those steps applies. So first of all, minus h-bar squared over 2m times the derivative with respect to x of the derivative with respect to x of psi of c. Now, I can take the derivative of psi with respect to xi, that I know how to do, that's just d psi d xi, because psi is a function of xi. But in order to turn this into a partial derivative with respect to x, I have to multiply by the derivative of xi with respect to x. So this is the chain rule at work here, and I know how to take the derivative of xi with respect to x, because I know xi is a function of x. This is just going to give me square root of m omega over h-bar. What I get if I solve for xi and then just differentiate with respect to x. This can then be pulled out front, it's a constant, doesn't contribute anything, minus h-bar, oops, I don't want to be an orange, minus h-bar squared over 2m times our constant, root m omega over h-bar, times partial derivative again with respect to x. But now I'm taking the partial derivative of the partial derivative of psi with respect to xi. So again, I have to apply the chain rule. What I'm going to get differentiating psi with respect to xi is a second derivative of psi with respect to xi now, times again a partial derivative of xi 
with respect to x. You can do this all in one step if you know that the partial derivative of xi with respect to x is simple. If the partial derivative of xi with respect to x had some problems in it, some, uh, some dependence, you would have two separate functions here. You wouldn't be able to factor it out as a constant, and you'd have to apply the product rule to this term. So be careful when you're doing this. Don't just assume that you can take a second partial derivative with the chain rule in one step. But the second step here, again, partial derivative of xi with respect to x gives me the square root of m omega over h bar, which as a constant I can pull out front and combine. What I'm left with for this term then is minus h bar squared over 2m times m omega over h bar, again giving me some nice cancellations, times the second derivative of psi with respect to xi. So this converts my derivative with respect to x into a derivative with respect to xi. I've converted my x into xi and all of my other x's into xi's just by changing the arguments of psi. So the overall equation I get now, minus h bar squared over 2m, m omega over h bar, second partial of psi with respect to xi, plus 1 half m omega squared h bar over m omega, xi squared psi equals e psi. This is good because we can do some cancellations. We can, for instance, cancel one of the omegas here, and we can cancel the m. We can also cancel an m here and one of the h bars. This, what's nice about this is I have h bar omega over 2 here and h bar omega over 2 here. So I have the same constant. And I'm going to move both of these constants, factor them out, move them over with the e to lump all of my constants together. I'm also going to change the ordering of the terms to get my two psi's together and mess with the signs a little bit. But the final equation you get is the second derivative of psi with respect to xi is equal to xi squared minus some constant k psi, where k is what we got when we aggregated all these constants together. It's need an equal sign there k is equal to 2e over h bar omega. So this is a differential equation that's substantially simpler than the differential equation we had here. Just by rearranging constants, we haven't actually changed the structure of the solution any. This differential equation isn't something that we want to just go ahead and try and solve with power series though, and you'll see why in a moment. Solutions that are most easily represented by power series are solutions that are only interesting near the origin. And this equation tends to be difficult to represent with power series because of what happens for, value, for large values of xi. So let's look for something called an asymptotic solution. Let's look for a solution for large xi. xi much, much greater than 1. What happens when xi is much, much greater than 1? Well, if xi is much, much greater than 1, I don't care about k here. It's going to be about equal to xi squared. xi squared minus k is about xi squared. That means the actual differential equation we have to solve is second derivative of psi with respect to xi is xi squared psi. Oh, and I've unintentionally changed notation here. This is a derivative of psi, not a partial derivative of psi. That doesn't really matter. Uh, the partial derivative and the total derivative are the same because psi now is only a function of x. Uh, likewise, I should also probably write capital psi here instead of lowercase psi. That's just an error. Apologies. This approximate equation has solutions. In the case of an asymptotic solution, we don't really care about the exact solution. An approximate solution is good enough if we can still use this approximation in our solution. So our approximate solution, and you can check this, is that the wave function is approximately equal to a times e to the minus xi squared over 2 plus b e to the xi squared over 2. Should rewrite that, or look like, look, make it more look like a c. So this equation is an approximate solution to this equation. And you can see that by taking the second partial derivative of psi. Um, I'll just look at this term, for instance. The second partial derivative of this term, d squared d x or d c squared of 
e to the minus c squared over 2 is, and you can plug this into whatever computational algebra tool you want, c squared minus 2 times e to the minus c squared over 2. So this again, approximately, for large values of xi, is going to be about equal to xi squared. So second derivative of this effectively pulled down a xi squared and gave us our function back. And that's what our approximate differential equation is. Now if you had a minus sign in front of the xi in the exponent here, you'd end up with much the same sort of expression. So you can see this is effectively an approximate solution to our approximate differential equation. This is useful in a couple of ways. First of all, there will be large values of xi. Unlike the case of the infinite square well, there's no sound reason for believing that the wave function will go to zero for large values of xi. It's certainly not required by the laws of physics. It is, however, required by the laws of mathematics. In order to have a normalizable wave function, this asymptotic behavior can't have any of this in it. So if we want our wave function to be normalizable, then b must equal zero. That's a requirement. What that tells us then, if we have something that's going to be a solution to the time-independent Schrodinger equation, its asymptotic behavior will be given by this. So psi is approximately equal for large c to some constant e to the minus c squared over 2. That's an approximate solution. This goes to zero, which is good, for large values of xi. This term behaves itself, but terms that go to, go to zero for large xi are hard to represent with power series, since power series are fundamentally polynomials, and if you have, say, a large value of xi raised to a large power, it's unlikely to go to zero. So what we'd like to do is effectively remove this asymptotic behavior from our differential equation. Going back to our exact differential equation, once again, this should be a capital C, a capital Psi. We want to remove that dependence. And we can do that by writing our Psi as Psi now being a function of Xi equal to some other function of Xi multiplied by e to the minus Xi squared over 2. If we substitute this equation in, hopefully we will be able to derive a new differential equation for our new function h that no longer has this asymptotic behavior, essentially factoring it out. So in order to substitute this in, we're going to need a second derivative of psi with respect to xi. So let's go ahead and calculate that. The first derivative of psi with respect to xi is, well, we have a product now. We're taking the derivative of a product. We have to use the product rule. So first, the derivative will hit the product, dh dxi. Apologies for my messiness here dxi, leaving the second term unchanged, e to the minus c squared over 2, plus the derivative hitting this, we'll leave h of xi unchanged. I'm not going to write h of c, just leave it as h. And then the derivative of this term. And the derivative of this effectually, effectively brings down the derivative of the exponent, which is going to be a minus xi. So I won't have a plus sign here. I'll have a minus sign. I'll have a xi and I'll have an e to the minus c squared over 2. These are what we get from the product rule here. Differentiating the exponential gave you the exponential itself multiplied by the inner derivative minus c. So that's our first derivative. Our second derivative necessarily gets a little more complicated taking the derivative of the first derivative. With this term, again, we have a product. So first, the derivative hits this, and we end up with the second derivative of h with respect to xi times the exponential unchanged, e to the minus c squared over 2, plus what we get from leaving this term unchanged and taking the derivative of this. And we know what that looks like. That's sort of what we got here, except the derivative is going to be what's unchanged. We're going to have a minus dh dxi xi, xi e to the minus c squared over 2. That's what we get from our first term. And if we continue taking derivatives, we need to differentiate the second term. We have a product now of three terms, so we'll get three additional terms here. 
But we already know what one of those terms looks like. If the derivative hits the h, we'll get a first derivative of h and a xi and an e to the minus xi squared over 2 left untouched, which is coming in with a minus sign. And that's exactly what we've got here. So I'm just going to make a little space here and say minus 2, two times this term. The other two terms, when the derivative hits the xi here, it's just going to eliminate the xi, and we're going to be left with h, e to the minus xi squared over 2. And when the derivative hits this term, we're going to bring down effectively another minus xi. So we're going to have plus h xi squared, e to the minus xi squared over 2. Now, what's nice about this is we have an e to the minus xi squared, e to the minus xi squared, e to the minus xi squared, e to the minus xi squared. We can factor that out of all the terms. And, well, let me just write down what we get. The second derivative here now is equal to d squared h d xi squared minus 2 xi h. Sorry. Changing the order of the terms, minus 2 xi d h d xi plus rearranging c squared minus 1 h with an e to the minus c squared over 2 factored out. This is all our left-hand side of our equation. And comparing our left-hand side and our right-hand side from up here, this psi now being h times e to the minus x squared over 2, both the left-hand side and the right-hand side here are going to have this e to the minus c squared over 2, which means we can cancel it out. So we've effectively gotten rid of our, e to, of our exponential dependence. Also looking at the left-hand side of the equation, you notice this c squared h, e to the minus c squared. If you look at the right-hand side, we have a c squared times h e to the minus c squared over 2 from the psi. So on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, we have this c squared term and these actually end up canceling each other out. So what I'm left with, in the end, the final differential equation, after rearranging some terms, is d squared h d x squared minus 2 x d h d x plus, rearranging constants, you end up with a k minus 1 h. And that's it. This is all just equal to 0. So this is our transformed ordinary differential equation. This is what we want to solve with power series. So how do we solve this? This doesn't really look all that more simple than the equations we started with. Solution by power series essentially proceeds as a guess. What we guess is that our solution, in this case our solution is h of xi, is going to be given by a power series with unknown coefficients, a0 plus a1 xi plus a2 c squared plus a3 c to the third power, you get the idea. This sum continues, potentially infinitely, so let's write it as an infinite sum. Sum of j equals 0 to infinity of a sub j c to the j. This is our general solution, and if we knew all of these coefficients, we would know everything about our solution. In order to substitute this into our differential equation, we're going to need to know first derivatives and second derivatives of this power series. So let's calculate a first derivative, dh dx. You can look at these terms individually and tell easily what the derivatives are. The derivative of a constant is 0, so this term doesn't appear. The derivative of a1 xc is just going to be a1. The derivative of a2 xc squared is going to be 2 a2 xc. 3, this is going to give us a 3 a3 c squared, etc., just taking the derivative of polynomials one term at a time. We can express that in this summation as well, sum from j equals 0 to infinity of taking the derivative of each of these terms effectively brings down the j and subtracts 1 from the exponent. So you'd have j a sub j c to the j minus 1. And you can tell just by plugging in j equals 0, j equals 1, j equals 2, that this is what you're going to get. For instance, if I plug in j equals 0, I have 0 times a0, so whatever these things are, 0. 
if I plug in 1, I have 1 times a1 times xc to the 1 minus 1, or xc to the 0, which is just a constant, so I just have a1, etc. You can continue this process to take the second derivative. Once again, either term by term, giving me 2a2 plus 3 times 2 times a3 xc plus etc. Or you can do it in the summation. Sum from j equals 0 to infinity of, again bringing down the exponent here, j times j minus 1 times a sub j times xc to the j minus 2. And once again, you can plug in j equals 0, j equals 1, j equals 2, etc. if you want to check to make sure that it works. So, into our differential equation, we are going to have to substitute these things, these sums. Our differential equation was d squared h dx squared minus 2xc dh dx plus capital K minus 1 h. And that was all equal to 0. So, easy terms first. This is going to be substituted in for h. The power series for the derivative of h is going to be substituted in for the derivative. And the power series for the second derivative is going to be substituted in for the second derivative. Where we're going with this is we'd like to get an equation that doesn't have any xs in it. And what that means is that we'd like each of these sums to have xi raised to the same power so that we can factor out the summation and have just the coefficient and the xi all by itself, nice and simple. In order to do that, we need to make the power that xi is raised to in each of these terms in the sum the same. For instance, I have this summation for h. It has a xi raised to the j power. And I have this summation for the second derivative of h. It has a c raised to the j minus 2 power. So what I'd like to do is rearrange the indexes in this sum so that I have a c raised to the j power. This is just a redefinition of index. I haven't actually, I'm not actually going to change anything about this equation, but I'm going to rewrite it as a sum over j going up to infinity of every time I see a j, I'm going to write a j plus 2 so that I have c to the j for my power. So this j will become a j plus 2, this j minus 1 will become a j plus 1, this a sub j will become a sub j plus 2, and running out of space, c to the j multiplied on. Now this is a little more subtle because this is outside the sum. I can't just replace 0 by 2 here. I actually have to replace it by minus 2. But if you look at what happens for minus 2 and minus 1, those terms end up contributing nothing. So I'm going to start my sum at 0 anyway. This has the advantage of making the summation itself look like the summation I've got here, which makes things easier to factor out. The term for the first derivative of h is a little more subtle, but it actually is, it ends up being easier to handle because it appears in the differential equation multiplied by xi. If I imagine multiplying this infinite sum by xi, I can distribute the xi through all the terms, and it's effectively going to just add 1 to the exponent of all the xi's. So I'm already going to have xi sub j here. So if I write out all these sums together, for the second derivative I had a summation over j going up to infinity of j plus 2, j plus 1, a to the j plus 2, c to the j, minus 2, and I'll distribute the c into the sum for the first derivative now. 2 times the sum, again it's a sum over j, going up to infinity, and the inside of the sum here was j, a sub j, xi to the j, after I multiply through by xi. My final term here has a k plus 1, out, or k minus 1, sorry, out front, and has a sum over j going up to infinity 
of just a sub j c to the j. And this is all equal to zero. Now each of these terms has a sum over j and a c to the j power in it. What that means is I can effectively treat these sums lining up the same lining up terms that are raised to the same power of c by effectively just pulling out the sum. So I can write this whole thing as a sum over j going up to infinity of j plus 2, j plus 1, a to the j plus 2. And if I factoring the sum out on the left, I can factor the c to the j out as well. So I'll write the c to the j out here on the right. If I factored out the c to the j, I'm now done with the first term. I can move on to the second term, which has a 2, a j, and an a sub j. Factoring c to the j out, I'm done with that term. And my third term just contributes a k plus 1, a sub j. And that's it. This is all multiplied by c raised to the j power, and it's all equal to 0. So this is what I get if I substitute in the power series solution for h in this differential equation. The nice part about the way I've manipulated the sums now is that the c to the j has been factored out. So this number in these square brackets represents the coefficient that is multiplied by c to the j power in my, um, in my power series. So in order for this equation to hold for all values of xi, we actually need this term here in square brackets to be equal to zero. Hopefully that's not too surprising. Um, essentially this means our polynomial here, there are relationships between the terms in our polynomial, in our power series. And that, reproducing, that's the condition. This is the condition we got from the coefficient of all the terms in, that in the power series in the last equation had to equal zero. This has to hold for each term in that infinite sum separately. And this is, a, this is the, the key step in a power series solution to an ordinary differential equation. We started with a solution, we started with an ordinary differential equation that had uh, strange asymptotic behavior and some funny constants. We factored those out. Then we substituted in a power series, which turned out to be a reasonably effective guess, because we were able to separate the equation out into a series of relationships. Effectively, this is an infinite number of equations now. Instead of one equation involving an infinite sum, we have an infinite number of equations, each involving only a few terms. This is called a recurrence relation because it tells you what these coefficients are in terms of each other. We have a to the j plus 2 and a to the j. Not a to the j, a sub j. So we can simplify this equation a little bit and solve for a sub j plus 2. And it's equal to these things. I'll mess with the signs a little bit, moving things around. 2j minus k plus 1 over j plus 2, j plus 1, a sub j. So this tells us what our a sub j plus 2 is in terms of a sub j. So if you remember our original expression for h of xi, it was a0 plus a1 xi plus a2 xi squared plus a3 xi to the third plus a4 xi to the fourth, etc. If I told you what a0 was, you would be able to use this expression, substituting in 0 for j, you could tell me what a sub 2 was. So a sub 0 determines a sub 2. a sub 2, in turn, using j equals 2 in this equation, you could tell me what a sub 2 plus 2, a sub 4, is. So a sub 0 determines a 2, determines a 4, determines a 6 in uh, an infinitely long chain. The same holds for the odds. If I told you what a 1 is, you could substitute j equals 1 in this and find a sub 3. If you knew a sub 3, you could find a sub 5. You knew a sub 5, you could find a sub 7. So we effectively have these two chains of coefficients. If you know a0 and a1, you can find 
all of your coefficients in your power series solution to this ordinary differential equation. We have these two unknowns, a sub 0 and a sub 1, and those correspond to the two unknowns you have when solving any other second order ordinary differential equation. For instance, Newton's law, the uh, second order ordinary differential equation that governs bodies, or governs the motion of bodies, has initial conditions. The position and the velocity of the particle must be known in order to determine the specific solution to the ordinary differential equation that you are working with. Those position and velocity numbers are analogous to a0 and a1 under these circumstances. We have two free parameters in both cases. Now we have a power series here, and if I tell you a0 and a1, you potentially have infinitely many terms determined by a0 and a1. Does that work? In particular, if you have an infinitely long power series, you may be worried about issues of convergence. Does the power series converge? Does it give you a sensible solution, or does this infinite sum blow up? Those are valid concerns. Really what the question is, is does this power series terminate? If the power series terminates, you don't need to worry about convergence. However, nope. if the power series does not converge, or does not terminate, converge is the wrong word, does not terminate, you can, by appropriately waving your hands, show that the power series you get, now looking back at the recurrence relation and proposing that j is extraordinarily large, we're dealing with very high order terms in the power series, you can show that the resulting power series for those large order terms behaves like e to the c squared. This, this is a problem, because our wave function psi was defined to be h times e to the minus c squared over 2. If h now is e to the c squared, what we'll end up with is e to the c squared over 2. Those large order terms in the power series will behave like e to the c squared over 2. And if our power series doesn't terminate, we will have a lot of these terms. So if our wave function is going to behave like c squared over 2, that was a problem. We used the requirement for having a normalizable solution to eliminate terms like this from our original solution. We had a, an approximate asymptotic solution that looked like this that we ruled out because it was non-normalizable. So it's appeared again as a result of our power series. That's not going to give us a good solution. What that means, therefore, our power series must terminate. It must end. And what that means is that we have some highest power. How could we get a highest power? Well, go back to our recurrence relation. Suppose our highest power is n. Our recurrence relation for n tells us 2n plus 1 minus k over n plus 2 n plus 1 multiplied by a sub n is a sub n plus 2. If we know that n is a highest power, we know this, this must equal 0. We can't possibly have an a sub n plus 2 if our highest power is n. So if we're going to have a highest power, we know this must equal 0. a sub n is non-zero, then this must be 0. And in order for this to be equal to 0, we have a condition on numerator here, namely that k is equal to 2n plus 1. Now if you remember what k was, k was related to the energy. This is ultimately where quantization comes from in the power series. But before I talk about quantization, I want to make another note about the structure of the power series. Our power series looked like a0 plus a1 xi plus a2 xi squared, etc. If my highest power were, say, a2, if I was going to terminate here, that's fine. I can have a non-zero a0, that determines a non-zero a2, and then my recurrence relation gives me zero for a4, effectively terminating my sum. That's okay. 
But if I have a non-zero A1, the recurrence relation for A1 will not give me zero for A3. And I won't get zero for A3, I won't get zero for A5 or A7 or A9 either. And I'll still have an infinite sum with my odds. Effectively what this means is that if I want a normalizable solution, not only does my power series have to terminate, but if I'm going to say terminate at an even power, I have to have no odd powers. I have to use zero for A1. So that takes away a good deal of the freedom I had when I was choosing my solutions. If I'm going to have a solution with even powers in it, terminating on an even power, I have to have no odd powers in my solution at all. So either we have evens or we have odds. Not both. So there are some limits on our power series that we get from this requirement of normalization. We have a condition here on k, and we have a condition on, depending on where we want to determine our power series, what other terms we're allowed to have. So, as I mentioned, this is what gives us quantization. We had k was equal to 2n plus 1. What k gave us, k was originally defined to be 2e over h bar omega. And if you combine these relations together, you end up with a condition on E, the separation constant, which we know is related to the energy. It's equal to h bar omega times n plus a half. This is our quantization condition, which we get from the requirement that our power series terminate. If our power series, sorry, now it what this means is that we have to choose our energy very carefully. We have an integer for n, and we have only a specific discrete set of allowed energies will give us normalizable solutions. What this looks like in the context of the solutions to the Schrodinger equation is if we have our solution, say, written as a function of C, treating this as now a sort of combined energy wave function axis, if I have, say, the energy of the wave function here, the energy constant E, if my wave function, say, starts here, and the energy is too high, you know that the wave function has a concavity that curves downwards when the energy is above, sorry, not curves downwards, curves towards the axis when the energy is above the potential. So we're going to be curving towards the axis here. We curve towards the axis until we reach a point where the potential is higher than the energy, at which point we start curving away from the axis. But if our energy is too high, we won't curve away from the axis enough to smoothly join with our axis. And then once the wave function has crossed the axis, it curves away from the axis, away from the axis, away from the axis, and blows up. It gives us a non-normalizable solution. This is what we were talking about in the context of if the energy was not exactly right, we got this sort of e to the x squared behavior, x squared over 2 behavior for large values of xi. If the energy is slightly too small, you get the same sort of behavior. The wave function doesn't curve towards the axis enough, so then when it starts curving away from the axis, it misses the axis entirely and curves upwards. Curving downwards, curving downwards, curving upwards, 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 oops, blows up. There is a happy medium in the middle, and that wave function curves downwards and then starts curving upwards at exactly the right rate to join with the axis. I'm not doing a very good job drawing this. This plot is duplicated in your textbook if you want to see what it looks like properly. But the, upwards, the amount of upwards curvature you get for the proper, dura proper, dura proper value of the energy results in the wave function downwards and then curving upwards and just barely joining in with the axis, never to leave. And you just have this e to the minus x squared asymptotic behavior for our overall solution. So what do these things look like? Well, the first few solutions we get we know they're going to be power series. 
and they're going to have terms like a0 plus a1 c plus a2 c squared, etc. But the first ones are pretty simple. a0 plus a1 c plus a2 c squared plus etc. going on to infinity. If I'm asking you for h0, the power series that terminates at a0, in order to get that, I have to say a0 is not equal to 0 because I want to have a solution with even powers in it, 0 being the only even power, I have to set n, the highest power I get, equal to 0. I correspondingly have to set a1 equal to 0, and I have the freedom to do that. What you get is pretty boring as a polynomial, h0 is just a0, not particularly useful. The wave function I get as a result, though, is useful because this is the lowest energy state. Psi sub 0, as a function of xi, is a0 times our e to the minus c squared over 2 function. So this is our ground state. This is our lowest energy stationary state solution to the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the quantum harmonic oscillator. If I want to know what the second solution is, this one is going to terminate at a1. So I'm going to have to have a0 equal to 0, because I don't want any even powers in my solution. I'm going to have to use n equals 1 for my highest power, and I'm going to have to have a1 not equal to 0, or I won't have a solution at all. h1, then, is just going to be a1 xi, and that gives me a wave function, psi1, of xi is a1 xi e to the minus xi squared over 2. That's my first excited state. The second energy level in the quantum harmonic oscillator. Stationary states, at least. If I want to know something slightly less trivial, I want to know what happens when I terminate my series at a2. If I terminate my series at a2, I know I'm going to have to have a0 not equal to 0, because I want terms with even powers in them. I'm going to have to use n equals 2 to terminate my series in my recurrence relation. n, now determining the energy, determining what the uh, how the recurrence relation terminates things. And I'm going to have to have a1 equal to 0 again, because I don't want any odd powers. In order to figure out what this looks like, we're going to have to go back to the recurrence relation. And if I write the recurrence relation for uh, known energy, energy given by this condition that we got to require the series to terminate, what the recurrence relation looks like actually has this number n, the highest power in it, instead. And it looks like minus, sorry, minus, I don't need a parenthesis just yet, minus 2 n minus j over j plus 2 j plus 1, all multiplied by a sub j. So this is what you get if you substitute the correct value of the energy in to the recurrence relation. If I use this, h2 of xi, is going to be a0, which is something non-zero, plus what do we get for a sub 2? Well, we have 0 substituting in for j, and 2 substituting in for n. So I'm going to have minus 2 and a 2 minus 0, and then in the denominator here I'm going to have 2 times 1. So I can cancel out the 2's, I'm left with just effectively a minus 2. So what I get here is a0, 1 minus 2 c squared. Oops, sorry, I forgot the c squared here. I also forgot the a0. Times e, sorry, that's it for h2. h2 is this. If I want to calculate what the wave function, psi2, looks like, it's going to be again this, a0, 1 minus 2 c squared, multiplied by e to the minus c squared over 2, our asymptotic solution. So this is psi2, the second excited state, the third energy level, what we get if we plug n equal 2 into our, uh, our framework here. So you can continue plugging in higher and higher values of n and using the appropriate 0 versus non-zero values of a0 and a1. So to check your understanding, Use the recurrence relation as above to calculate not h2, that's too easy, I just did it for you. Calculate h3. So, figure out what value of n you use to terminate. 
figure out which of the a0 or a1 have to be non-zero, and go through to determine the terms in the polynomial h3. These polynomials actually have a name. They're called Hermit polynomials, and they have enough mathematics surrounding them that we know a lot of their properties. There's, of course, more than five of them. There's an infinite set. And they obey the properties that you would hope they obey. There is an orthogonality relation. There is a normalization condition, etc. And given the standard definition that you get from textbooks or from Wolfram Alpha or from Mathematica for the Hermite polynomials, they have this normalization 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32 for the highest power. If we want to express our wave function in terms of these textbook definitions of Hermite polynomials, instead of the h's that I've been using, psi sub n as a function of x, which is going to be expressed in terms of xi, where x is root h bar over m omega xi. Putting all the normalization and all of the mathematical machinery together, you end up with something that looks familiar if you watched the lecture on solving the this particular Schrodinger equation for this particular potential with ladder operators. m omega over pi h bar raised to the one fourth power times something specific to the Hermite polynomials, a normalization to take care of the Hermite polynomial definitions, square root of 2 to the n, n factorial, multiplied by the nth Hermite polynomial as a function of xi, times e to the minus xi squared over 2. And this is our general expression of the stationary state wave functions resulting from power series analysis, expressing them in terms of Hermite polynomials instead of in terms of ladder operators acting on the sort of lowest energy, the ground state, the first solution, the lowest energy solution. So that's the power series solution to the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the quantum harmonic oscillator. We get an infinite series of states, and we get quantization conditions on the energy, where the energy of the nth state is given by h bar omega, oops, that's not an omega, h bar omega n plus a half, where n now is equal to 0, 1, 2, etc., up onto infinity. So we have a ladder of evenly spaced states now. Contrast this with the infinite square well potential, where we had energies that were proportional to n squared, and you, get a, you start to see a little bit of the diversity of solutions that we get from quantum mechanics. The overall conceptual structure of the solutions is the same. You started with a wave equation, you apply boundary conditions and normalization conditions, and you restrict your set to a particular quantized set of energies. Then you express your stationary states in terms of the results of all of your mathematical analysis. That's the general procedure that you follow in terms of finding stationary states.